Hi, you're with us in Music Lab, where we invite music acts to our studio. I've got Sean Hong Wei here with me, a saxophone player, who's considered one of Singapore's brightest young jazz musicians. Currently based in New York, Sean has played gigs all over the world. And earlier this year, Sean marked a milestone when his debut album with Singapore jazz veteran Jeremy Montero, called the New Jersey Sessions, hit the top 20 in the American jazz charts. Hi, Sean, and welcome to Music Lab. Hi, Dino. How are, How are you? you? I'm good, I'm good. All right, all yeah. right. So congratulations on the album getting into the USA National Jazz Week mm -hmm. charts. Thank you. That's <laughs> quite an achievement for a 25-year-old from Singapore, right? How do you feel about that? I feel great. I mean, I'm very happy that our album managed to, you know, stay on the charts. And this week will be its eighth week, I think, wow. being on the top 50 uh, jazz charts. Yeah. And, and you guys are... On the charts, it's, it's like albums from all over the world, right? Or is it yeah, just I think I think it's like, um, you know, yeah, I think it's albums from everywhere. And, it's great. Mm. And you're back in Singapore for right. a couple of months, right? Mm -hmm. All right? And you're based in New York, Brooklyn, right? That's right. Mm. Yeah. Right. So tell us what you're doing there. So I, I'm pursuing uh, my undergrad in uh, music there in the new school. And I'm on scholarship from both the Jazz Association of Singapore and from the New School too. And yeah, I've, I finished two years there and I have two more years left to go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. And New York is considered the jazz capital of America. Mm -hmm. Tell us what it's like for a Singaporean musician playing there. Well, uh, indeed, New York is really special when it comes to the arts, I feel. Mm -hmm. And the, the level of playing and... The, yeah, the the level is just really high there, and you know you hear a lot of jazz greats that are still living in New York, and many like upcoming younger cats, and you can almost never find a day that you have nothing to do in New York. You know, every day there's somebody to see, there's somebody to hear, there's jam sessions to go to, and you'll never get bored. So as a Singaporean living there, I feel very blessed to have these opportunities to meet the older cats, mm. and you know, like uh, hang around people my age there who really care about the music and are serious about it. You know? So it's yeah. very inspiring to be there. Okay, I'm looking at your Instagram and, you know, there's a lot of pictures of you with like all the veterans who are playing at the clubs, uh, right. you know, the jazz scene there. What's that like for someone, you know, in your 20s or that? Is there a distinction between like the veterans and up-and-coming players like yourself? Or does everybody mm. just mix around and, and, and play together? I mean... To, like uh, I think in especially the jazz tradition there's a like respecting the elders and you know really studying the tradition of where the music came from is a huge huge part of the whole whole thing and you know to, to be able to meet um, older cats in, in jazz like cats are mm. like musicians you know so yeah. older cats like for example in new school Reggie Workman who mm. is a great bass player who has you know, done so much and played with so many of my saxophone greats. Mm -hmm. So he teaches in new school and through new school, I got to know him and, you know, have his, uh, take on his classes, his ensembles. And yeah, there's a lot of wisdom and knowledge to be imparted into the younger ones. And that has always been a thing with the older and younger musicians, uh, I think throughout the whole world, not mm -hmm. just in New York. Even in Singapore. Yeah. Right. Does it matter to them that you're from Singapore? Uh, are you considered like an outsider coming in uh, um, to a, a close-knit jazz scene there? Not really, because mm. I feel that, uh, you know, music is one of the only things in the world that really permeates through throughout the whole world, regardless of race and the differences we have as, you know, humans. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so music is much bigger than where I'm from or how I look like. Yeah. Music is accepting of right. each one, mm. yeah. How often do you play? Okay. In New York? Yeah. Uh, maybe once once or twice a week. You okay. know? And But I, I try to go out to listen to music, to get inspired, mm. you know, and uh, go out to jam sessions, mm. you know, to uh, meet new, new cats and see friends. Right. Yeah. So are these 
gigs at regular sports or do you like do several clubs? Uh, it's mostly like separate clubs. Like whenever, okay. you know, there's this club or that club, you know, there's not really like a... There are only a few places in New York that still have regular bands like throughout the week, mm. you know, like Smoke or Village Vanguard. You know. And how, how do you get the shows? Do you get invited or do you like... Sometimes you get invited um, as a side man or as a band leader. Sometimes mm. you have to write in emails to the jazz clubs or the yeah. people booking the clubs. Yeah, it's a whole whole other thing, you know, mm. like music is one thing, but getting to the music is another. Yeah. And who's in the audience when you play at these clubs? How how big are they? Mm, I, I feel like the the people in New York, they really, most of them really dig the music, you know, mm. like, for example, when you go to Village Vanguard. Um, that's a club. That's a, that's a club uh, mm. and it has been around for a long time and it's mm. one of the best listening rooms I've been to. And people that go there know that they are paying yeah. the cover to go and watch like something great that night, you know. So everyone's like really into the music. Everyone's quiet. They're not talking and they're there for the music, you know. So it's nice when you play to that kind of audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because not every time you get that, you know, some people are talking, being rowdy. And sometimes yeah. it's hard to get the message across sometimes, yeah. Right. And how do you juggle studies with uh, with gigs? Say like classes in the morning and then gigs at night? Yeah, kind of like that. I mean, uh, I'm lucky to be in the music school, so mm. school is oriented around music. So that's great to have. Um, if I was studying like mathematics or something, mm. that would be hard to juggle, you know. Um, yeah, classes are, are mostly in the day and... Mm. And the activities are in the night. <laughs> mm, okay. Yeah, like jam sessions or gigs, you know. All right. Yeah. Do you always play with a fixed, uh, uh, same musicians every night or? Uh, not not all the time. I mean, people are always trying to, you know, because in New York, there are so many musicians in mm. New York. So people are always trying to meet new people and try to form new bands mm. and new kind of band sounds and trying to work and see whether like, it's a cohesive thing or is it just a band of musicians that are great by themselves but like not really have a band thing, you know? Mm. So so I, I, I kind of play with like uh, different people most of the time still trying to find my crew, you know? Right. Yeah. right. So after you came out from Singapore, you, yeah. you weren't just stuck here. You did mm. some shows in the region as well. You went to China, you <coughs> went to Thailand. Right, right. Tell us about the, this tour. Tell us about the shows that you've been doing outside of Singapore recently. Right. So uh, I, I just came back from Shanghai with uh, Jeremy yesterday, Jeremy mm -hmm. Montero. And we went with a great Singapore singer, Alame Fernandez. Mm -hmm. Alame. And yeah. Joe Lee, the guitarist, and Tamago on drums. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was pretty fun. We played at Jay-Z Jazz Club. Mm -hmm. And we also did a National Day event. And the week before that, I was in Bangkok. Yeah. Uh, you know, meeting up some friends and I played a show with uh, some great Thai musicians mm -hmm. at a great jazz club called Alone Together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think before that, we, uh, Jeremy and I and a great guitarist from New York, one of my good friends, Ravi Campbell, mm -hmm. we went up to KL to do some okay. shows too. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, this trip has been really nice, like mm -hmm. getting to play music outside of Singapore and, you know, connecting with old friends and new mm -hmm. friends, yeah. Tell us about life as a touring musician. You know what what's what's it actually like? Um, tiring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, Is it but, always like super late nights and then? Uh, I mean, we, the, uh, uh, so far the tours has been pretty short, so it's been right. kind of chill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I haven't done like a extended tour where like you know you hit multiple cities like mm -hmm. back to back. So I would think like that is really tiring. Tiring. Um. Yeah, but apart from the flights, like I I do enjoy it a lot, you know, getting to eat like different food, mm. meeting new people and hanging at the, their jazz clubs, you yeah. know, to see what their scene is like mm. and getting to sit in with the musicians there. It's always a good time, like being away, you know. Right, right. <clears throat> Any downsides to touring? Mm. Just the flights, I guess. Okay. <laughs> you, know, you lose time yeah. on the on the planes mm. and getting to the airport and all that stuff but you know right. it's fine <laughs> is, it, is a lot of the time like spent waiting I mean the yeah. shows are usually what, like an hour long or so and then the rest of the day right. what, what do you do 
Yeah, so most of the time we have like, you know, sound check or we have to rehearse the band, mm. the music. So that takes up time too, you know, mm. unless like the rehearsals are done before the tour, you know. All right. What's your mem- most memorable show to date so far? Most memorable show? It doesn't matter whether it's Singapore or New York. Well, I, I have memorable shows both in Singapore and New York. But, okay, let's start um, with Singapore first. Singapore? Yeah. Well, um, yeah, one of the most memorable ones is probably like the first Lion City Jazz Festival we had. Okay. Um, with the Jazz Association Big Band and that was featuring one of the mentors, Benny Golson. Were you playing with the, the youth orchestra? Or yeah, the I, main I was orchestra? with the youth, the youth at orchestra. the time. I think I was probably 17 or 18. Oh, that was quite well back. Yeah, that yeah. was like the first uh, kind of time I played with jazz like. Okay. Yeah, and mm-hmm. they brought in this really great uh, tenor saxophonist, Manny Golson, mm-hmm. who is one of the jazz greats. You know, he grew mm-hmm. up with John Coltrane and mm-hmm. he had like so many stories. And to me, I felt like at that point, like being able to, you know, meet somebody like that from mm-hmm. Singapore and ha- like to be on the stage with him, to mm-hmm. hear his stories uh, was like very surreal to me. Mm-hmm. You know, I was like, whoa, like I actually have the opportunity to meet someone like him like right here at home yeah and and you were 17 that means you yeah, were what, 17 and, uh, or 18 JC or like post secondary uh, school Polly I was Polly, in okay. SP at mm, the time right, right yeah so that was one of my favourite experiences um, also another one was a gig I can't really remember where but it was with Jeremy Uncle Lewis mm-hmm. and Louis uh, Christy Soliano. yeah mm. Louis Soliano and Christy Smith who uh, recently the late just Christy Smith. Yeah, mm. left us um, yeah I remember that pretty fondly because you know those guys are like my mentors right. and mm. yeah, I remember that was a fun gig yeah that, that's like Singapore mm. how about uh, overseas in overseas uh yeah, one of my most memorable memorable gigs was a Coltrane tribute, mm-hmm. a John Coltrane tribute with a uh, Reggie Workman, uh, Billy Harper, Billy Hart, like jazz um, greats, veterans, you know, veterans. Where was this? Uh, this was in New York in Harlem. Okay. Yeah, so it was a tribute concert for Coltrane, and yeah, it was with Itama, my, my friend in New York too. Mm-hmm. Am I missing anyone? Reggie, Billy Harper. Yeah, and like that, that was super surreal for me too, you know, because mm. Reggie used to play with John Coltrane. Right. And to pay tribute to John Coltrane mm. with with Some Reggie his, was original really, really members, special, yeah. you know, because, mm. yeah, John Coltrane's music has deeply impacted me as mm. a person. And yeah, it was like uh, the circle right. came like, yeah. And that wasn't too long ago, right? I that was, was in October last year. Okay. Yeah. Right. Let's get back to your album, The New mm. Jersey Sessions. That's the first album, your debut album. Mm-hmm. Right. So how did you end up like doing the album with Jeremy Montero? <clears throat> right. Um, so I remember we recorded that album my first month in New York. Yeah. Yeah. Like I and just when moved. Was that? 20... That, this was August 2022. Okay. You yeah. just got there. I just got there mm. and I was still like settling down, you know, getting furniture and like yeah. still kind of shook mm. like <laughs> by the city, you know. <laughs> yeah. And Jer- Jeremy always like... Um, he flew up with you? No. Uh, so he, he, I moved, I was there already and yeah. Jeremy came oh, he over. he came over to New York. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Jeremy like wanted to record this album like together. I think like as a, you know, like to take a snapshot of what uh, we sounded like at that time. Right. You know, because... Mm. You guys have been playing a lot together around that time? Right? Yeah, we, we've been playing like throughout the years and mm-hmm, I think he okay. wanted to take a snapshot of like how both of us like, you know, were like at that very point in time because New York is probably going to change like how I sound like throughout the years oh, too. Oh, right. So, so it's like a snapshot of you fresh in New York, fresh from Singapore? like. Yes, I yeah, I suppose. And <laughs> okay. but it was really nice. I remember the that recording session very vividly. And yeah, it was it was great. It was a beautiful day. We went to John Lee, John Lee's house, uh, to record the album. 
Who is John Lee? So okay. John Lee is a great bassist that has worked mm. with DZ Gillespie okay. for right. like mm. in the last years of DZ's life. And he's uh he has he's leading all the DZ bands now, the mm. alumni, okay. All Stars and the Big Band. And John Lee was the one who gave me my first gig in New York too. Oh so, wow, okay. Mm. Yeah, I'm very grateful for that. Mm. And yeah. right. 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 So I understand that you picked up the saxophone while you were in secondary school. Yes, sir. You were in a secondary school band, yes. right? Right. Did you play any other instruments before that? No. So my first instrument was the alto, like alto saxophone. And that was in St. Pat's uh, military band. Okay. And later on, I picked up the piano and more recently the flute. But I started off just with the alto when I was 13 13. Yeah, 13 yeah. So what led you to joining the school school band? band? Uh, it's a funny story actually like because <clears throat> they had like this orientation where where they you know we were sec one students and okay. the band I remember the band sat uh, in a circle behind us mm -hmm. and they were playing like I think Lady Gaga or something. Some pop stuff. Some some like, pop stuff. Okay. And mm -hmm. you know at that point I wanted to join the soccer team because like I really oh, loved you playing soccer. Oh you were a big football yeah. fan. Okay. Yeah. But like, um, yeah, I remember like turning around and it was the saxophone section. Mm -hmm. I was like, wow, this thing quite shiny. Eh? <laughs> I was like, wow, it looks quite interesting. You know, so many metal metal stuff and looks shiny and So bling, you never bling, had any you experience know? with the saxophone before never, that? Before never, you were 13? Never, before that? Never. The ECA orientation thing? No, not really. Okay. So I just turned around and I was like, wow, this thing looks mm -hmm. you know, quite shiny and looks cool. Yeah. And I was like, you know what, I'll give it a shot. Okay, so yeah, you signed up. So I signed up for band, and, and you told them specifically you wanted to play the saxophone, not like the yeah, drums. Yeah, I, I told them I wanted to play the saxophone. Okay. You know, cause and there was an opening. Yeah, because I thought it looked cool. Okay. Like that, yeah. Right. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this was, so that's how it started. Yeah. And I understand also that you got into jazz at around the same time. Yes. yes. Right. Mm. So what, which came first? The ECA or? <clears throat> the, the CCA, the CCA uh, so. came first, but uh, it was also like my first week of playing the saxophone, I think. Mm -hmm. And you know, like, cause when people hear like saxophone, you associate it with like, oh, jazz saxophone. Yeah. Like, yeah. So I was curious. So I went on YouTube and I typed like saxophone jazz. Mm -hmm. And the first thing that popped up and the first thing that I listened to was Charlie Parker's Yeah But Sweet. Okay. Mm. And I remember when I first heard it, I was like, Damn, I've never heard music that way. What were you listening to back then? Like, back then, it was like punk rock. Oh, wow. <laughs> Before jazz, okay, you know, like, like my, and... my Chemical Romance, right. Fall Out Emo, Boy. Emo, rock. Yeah, that kind of stuff. But like never jazz, you know. Mm. And then I heard Bird, like Charlie Parker, and that changed everything. You know, mm. I was like, I, I yeah, something just clicked in me. I was like, man, I want right. to be able to play this music, you know, like mm -hmm. it connected with me. And yeah, the rest is history. Like That was my first love, like Charlie Parker. Yeah. All right. And then after secondary, secondary school, you say you went to Polytechnic. What did you study there? Right. So in Poly, my first year, I actually did banking and finance. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. And I, I dropped out and I went to music and audio tech. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I poly, in, in Singapore yeah, Poly itself. In Singapore DMAT, Poly too. Right? Yes. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I chose banking and finance because, you know, the, my parents are like, oh, it's a, it's cool, you want to do music, but go and get a backup first. Ah. <laughs> it's a typical Singaporean yeah. thing, you know. Okay. But I was like, okay, you know what, I'll give it a shot. So I How long a, did you try? How long were you in the uh, banking? banking? Yeah. Half a, half a year. Okay. Yeah. And it was at that point where I had my first, uh, first gig, my first professional jazz gig. And then I remember thinking to myself, if if I wanna like do this music thing, yeah. I can't do both. There's no way I can juggle both, like, right. f like banking, finance, and music. Mm -hmm. So I had to choose, you know. Mm. And I chose music. Yeah. Right. Did you ever consider like going to any uh, music schools or? Uh, back then, no, because uh, uh, back then SP had a great jazz jazz band program. Okay. Led All by right. Joshua One, you know, the, the great pianist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I learned a lot from there too and met a lot of my close friends there. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. And then what happened after after you graduated from Singapore Poly? After I graduated from SP, I think then COVID hit and then I, oh. I went in the army. Yeah. Okay. So were you yeah. doing any like live stream shows or you know Yeah. I mean 
live stream shows, yes. Um, we did a few with Jazz Association, you mm. know, and also a few with Eden Resources. Uh, Chris Troy was sponsoring some of the live streams back mm. then. Yeah, and it was a weird time. <laughs> right, weird right. time, you know, playing to cameras and... Yeah, because this music leaves and breathes. Mm. Uh, you need like people, you know, you feel yeah. the energy in the room. And you were just starting out, starting out because you just finished school and... Yeah, back back then I was playing quite a bit already. Okay. Yeah. But, mm. um, yeah, it was like a, you know, COVID was a weird time to be right. in. <laughs> right, right. But how everyone, did you yeah. s- start gigging here in Singapore? Like, was mm. it through the Jazz Association? Or? Um, one, I mean, most of my gigs when I first started out was with the SB Jazz Band. Ah, right. Yeah. Okay. Then, mm. uh, and how often was that? That. I, I remember uh, we used to have this band called Das Gafu, like Aaron James Lee. Okay. We was with Aaron mm-hmm. James Lee, Audrey, and uh, Kenji. And Das Gafu was this like four-piece jazz band that we had uh, weekly jam sessions at Blue Jazz. Okay. And we, we did mm-hmm. that for almost three years, I think. And that was when like, yeah, that was the most regular thing we had back then. And kind of like taught me how to play, you know, really, because you can practice as much as you want to at home, mm, but you yeah. need to play the music with other people. Right. Yeah. And that's how like we grew together. Right. That weekly jam. Yes. That weekly yeah. gigs at Blue Jazz. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So that was a big part of my growth, I feel. All right. Mm. Speaking of practicing at home. Yeah. The saxophone's a pretty loud instrument. <laughs> do you get yes. any like do you get any grief from the neighbors or anything when, when you're practicing? Uh well I'm very lucky that one of my roommates in New York is a saxophonist too. Okay. Will. Okay. So uh yeah, and the other one is also kinda like a musician in theater. He writes music for right. the theater shows mm. and so I'm kinda lucky in that way. Like mm. so when we practice, you know, we try to be mindful of the volume and not you know, full volume. Maybe I'll practice at like 60% right. of my actual volume. Okay. Yeah, and try not to go past like, you know, 10, 30 at night or something. But How about when you were in Singapore? When I was in Singapore, yeah, I never had problems. Okay. Luckily. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. That's true. <laughs> so at which point did you <clears throat> decide that, you know, music, jazz music was something that you wanted to take seriously? Mm. That this was what you wanted to do with your life? Mm. Great question. Um, like, like I told you, like um, Charlie Parker, when I first heard him, when mm. I was 13. So at that point in 13, you at, already knew that. I mean, at that point, I felt like I knew deep down inside, like this was something I wanted to do. Yeah. And not banking. Uh. And not banking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, and... But I think what really kind of solidified it for me was, um, you know, in St. Pat's, I met my first few teachers, uh, Tio mm-hmm. Bun Chai and Fabian Lim, okay. who, who were from St. Pat's band too. Mm-hmm. And then it was only in SP where I I realized that, whoa, Singapore has a jazz scene, you know, there are jam okay. sessions and there mm-hmm. are jazz musicians to watch. There are people already doing this in Singapore. Because mm-hmm. in secondary school, I had I had no idea, like, there was a jazz scene, you know? Right. I always thought like, well, I love listening to jazz and, mm-hmm. you know, I try to learn the but music. But you were not going to gigs so or anything. No, because I didn't know like right. at okay. that point, you know? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, only in SP that I met friends and we went out to jam sessions, went out to gigs. Mm-hmm. And I was like, whoa, you know, <laughs> it's possible to right, do this right. here, you know? Right. So what happens, uh, what will happen after you finish school right now? Mm-hmm. You're going to be a full-time musician? Yeah, so I have two more years left of mm-hmm. undergrad and I plan to do my master's in the New York okay. too. In, New in the York same too. school, in the new school? Uh, we'll, we'll see. I'll apply to a few and okay. we'll see. But So I kind of have like four more years left mm-hmm. in New York. Including that's, the master's? Including my master's. So that's kind of like my timeline. And mm-hmm. then I plan to come back to Singapore after that. Yeah, because of family Right. I mean, as as much music is important to me, but family is important too. Mm-hmm. And, you know. And what will you do then? Um, I mean, when I'm back in Singapore, I'll probably like teach. You know, teach, and yeah, maybe at La Salle or 
somewhere else. And yeah, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Do you come from a musical family? Like, are there musicians? Uh, Man, not at family? all. <laughs> not at all? So not you're the first all. one? I Yeah, I'm the mm-hmm. first one in my family. Yeah. And what do your parents think? Uh, Well, at first, you know, they were like, I mean, they, they've always been very supportive. Okay. They, you know, mm. they bought me my first saxophone when I was 13, I think. Yeah. And yeah, they, they've they always been supportive and never like, you know, like... They've never questioned your... No, not really. Your your goal of being a, not, a no, full-time musician. No, they never questioned okay, me. And that's yeah. great. And I think that's, as, as parents, you should, you know, if you see like your children really loving mm-hmm. something, you should just let them do it, you know? Right, because they're gonna do it anyways. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> Even if you tell them not to. So okay, yeah. So Sean, I I understand that you have a very interesting story about this particular saxophone right, right, here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Tell us about this. Okay, this um, beauty here. So this this saxophone that I have um uh, used to belong to one of my great uh, friends and mentor mm. Tan Wei Xiang. Wei Xiang. Yeah. Okay. So Wei Xiang actually found this. A horn in a pawn shop in Singapore, like maybe ten plus years ago. Like a regular old pawn shop in Singapore. Yeah, just a pawn shop in <laughs> Singapore near Haji Lin, if I remember correctly. Yeah, and he got it like for a few hundred dollars, and okay. you know had it overhauled. It was it was found in like a bad shape, you know, like mm-hmm. parts were missing and everything. Yeah, and and I remember one time I was overhauling my saxophone, and I asked Wei if. I could borrow this horn because I knew he had this horn. Right. So I was like, you know, I'll borrow this while waiting for my saxophone. And mm-hmm. then I played it. I was like, man, this horn is really nice. Right. You know, and I was like, wait, can I buy it off you? Yeah. And then he like, he refused to let me buy it off him. Mm-hmm. And then he was like, uh, as long as you play it, it's yours. Okay. I was like, no, I have to give you some bread, you know? Yeah. And yeah. Then he was like, if you really want to give me money, just give me a dollar. So I a gave dollar. him, That's I gave him two fifty cents coin. I remember. <laughs> you give him yeah. two fifty cent coins. Yeah, but yeah, it's this one is really precious, you know. Like um, You paid a dollar for it. How much do you think it's worth right now? Maybe eight grand, seven, eight grand maybe. But this horn You're uh, not gonna sell it, right? No, never. <laughs> Why what, what what makes it so special like compared to your other saxophones? Oh uh, well vintage horns are special because you know the workmanship back then was mm. So wait, when you yeah. say vintage, how old how old is it exactly? Uh, this is about nineteen sixty six. Yeah, okay. Based on the serial number. Mm-hmm. And it's a Selma Mark Six. Uh, yeah. It's a great horn. It's like the Stradivarius mm. of violin. The Stradivarius yeah. of saxophones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow. So. All right. Okay, Sean, we're down to our last question. This yeah, is something yeah, sure. that we always ask um mm. all the musicians who come down here. Where do you see yourself in five to ten years' time? You would have been like 30, 35. You know, like, well, where are you and what are you doing? Hmm. Uh, I mean, hopefully by then, not hopefully, I know for sure that mm. I'll still be playing the saxophone. Mm. <laughs> you know? um, in Singapore? Or are you, will you I'll be probably, traveling? I'll probably be back in Singapore and, mm. you know, I think, yeah. And yeah, I think my, uh, I'll, I'll probably work a lot more with the Jazz Association of mm. Singapore because right. um, yeah it's a great association and you know I'll probably try and see what I can do to grow the scene in Singapore mm. mm-hmm. like are you already how, doing yeah. that? are you mentoring like younger mus- musicians here? Uh, I I have a few students here oh, okay. yeah, and mm-hmm. um, back back in New York too yeah but um more, more like big picture, you know, how, how mm. can I help and be a part of the bigger scene, you know, in the future. Mm. Right now, I'm like focused on the music and, you know, getting my stuff together, my my music together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay, Sean, thank you for sharing yeah, your story thank you so and thanks much. for coming down. It's yeah. been a pleasure having you. Thank you, Adina. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thanks for watching. And remember to like, subscribe and share. And don't forget to hit the bell icon.